YA, how is everybody doing tonight? Are you good? Awesome. Well, I'm glad to be back. I feel like I haven't seen you guys in like months. It's been two weeks, but uh, I miss you guys. I really do. I, we had Easter a couple weeks ago. How many people were here uh, at one of our Easter services at Red Rocks? So good, so amazing. And then I had the privilege of taking our amazing class of interns to go visit our Brussels, Belgium campus. Um, for those of you that don't know, Red Rocks Church actually has a campus in Brussels, Belgium, and every year we take the interns there to help support. And so Brussels sends its love to us uh, here at Young Adults, but uh, turn to your neighbor, give him a hug, a high five, a handshake. You can take a seat. Let them know that you have prayed all week to sit by them. And God has answered your prayers. Hey, I am, I'm genuinely so, so excited um, for the series that we're in. We're in a series that's entitled For the One. Um, and the heart behind this series actually comes from Luke chapter 15. It's a, ser- it's a set of three parables. A parable about a lost coin, a parable about a lost sheep, and one of the most famous parables in all of Scripture, one of the foundational stories that our church was built on and founded upon, the parable of the lost son. And what it really does is it conveys God's heart for, and his passion for reaching people who do not yet have a relationship with him. And I think what is so easy for us, especially in our cultural climate today, is for us to have a faith in Jesus, for us to have a personal relationship with God, but to make it a very private thing, to make it a very a very personal thing to the point where it doesn't infect every single aspect of our life. And one of the final words that Jesus actually said to us before he ascended into heaven, remember Jesus is not dead, he is actually alive and he is in heaven as a living new being like right now. But one of the final words he said to his followers was this, go into the world and take this message to as many people as possible. And I think what can happen and what a natural default of us as followers in 2023 is that we have experienced Jesus and we have encountered this life-changing, life-altering message. But because of our cultural climate or maybe insecurities, it becomes this very deeply personal thing that we no longer have a passion for going and sharing with other people. And I think when we hear the words of Jesus, which is go into all the world, we think we need to win the world. But what I love about the heart of God is that, and we'll explore this more next week, but those parables say that all of heaven celebrates over just one person who hears and receives the invitation and the good news of Jesus. And so as a young adult group, we thought, what if we just challenged our entire ministry? What if we just challenged our entire community not to go out and reach Denver, not to go out and reach their entire school, not to go out and reach their entire workplace. But what if over the next three weeks, last week, this week, and next week, we challenge you to have a conversation about your faith and invite somebody to young adults with just one person. Imagine the impact that if every single one of us in this room had a conversation with one person, imagine the celebration that could take place in heaven. And so in the next couple weeks or the next couple uh, times we're together, we're going to be talking about sharing our faith or what Christians call this term evangelism. And tonight, I want to read a story that I think will be very helpful to us when it comes to inviting people to church and having a conversation about faith. And the story is in John chapter 9, starting in verse 1. And Uh, If you have your Bible, you can follow along. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along on the screen. We'll have it up there. It's a pretty big chunk. It's uh, verse 1 through 25. So if you haven't read your Bible at all this week, don't worry. This makes up for it all. We'll cover it all up uh, tonight. But uh, John chapter 9, starting in verse 1, it says this. It says, As he, being Jesus, went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither. This man or his parents sinned, Jesus said. 
But this happens so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, weird flex, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself said, yo, I'm that guy. Like that was me. How then were your eyes open? They, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. I might not have done it that way, but that's how he did it, and it worked. Uh, he told me to go to Siloam and wash, and so I went and washed, and I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought him to the Pharisees, the man who had been blind. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him, how did he recover his sight? He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. It's amazing how Jesus is willing to kind of cross self-imposed religious boundaries to reach broken people. I just love that about Jesus. He says this, but others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What do you have to say about him? It was your eyes that he opened. The man replied, uh, I guess he's a prophet. Uh, I don't know. Like They still did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until they sent the man's parents. Y'all, they went and got his mom and dad. Like This is getting a little insane. They got his parents. Uh, Let's see, where am I? How is it that he can now see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how can he now see or who opened his eyes? We don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anybody who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue, meaning excommunicated from church. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned this poor man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, listen, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. Here's the, here's the one thing that I do know. I was blind, but now I see. I was once blind, but now I see. Tonight, I want to talk about sharing our faith. Sort of where does the fire for the passion to share our faith come from? And then what do we do when we have this encounter with God and people don't believe us and they, maybe they have questions or are skeptical about the encounter that we have that we want to share with them? And so let's pray and then we're going to dive in. I have a lot to say and a little bit of time to say it, okay? So we got some ground to cover, all right? Jesus, we love you. We are thankful for you. God, I pray that anybody in this room tonight who's wondering if you're real, whose soul is crying out for something deeper, who knows that the life that they're living is not life to the full and they've searched and they've, they're coming up empty. Jesus, will you be who you are to us tonight? The fulfillment of our soul's greatest desire, the longing of our heart's cry, eternity birthed in us, salvation, freedom, peace. Jesus, we love you, and it's in your name we pray. And everybody said here tonight, amen and amen. Personally for me, one of the most frustrating things in the world is when you are telling a story, a story that you know is true, a story that you have maybe even lived out yourself, you're telling a story, and as you're telling it, you can see in your audience's eye that they are not believing all of the words that are coming out of your mouth. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? When you're like sharing a story you've experienced and there's some hesitation, maybe your friends, your family thinks you're exaggerating or they're just not believing you. Anybody? Just me and the two people over here. Okay, well, for some of you, it's going to happen to you one day, and you can recall this moment, okay? So when Erin and I were first dating, Erin did not believe a lot of the things that I used to tell her. 
Um, being from Virginia, growing up, a lot of my friends still live in the Washington, Washington D.C., Northern Virginia area. And moving out here, I don't have a lot of friends to validate all the stories of my middle school, high school, and college escapades. All of our adventures, all of our dumb moments, all of the football Friday night highlights that were probably way more important to us than it was to anybody else in the world. You know, the interception that took place that made me feel like a hero when really it was just a scrimmage against our JV team, whatever, but... I would tell Aaron these stories of all of these things that me and my friends used to do. And I could just tell that she was like super skeptical. Like, I love you. I know you believe in Jesus. I don't think you're an outright liar, but I think you might be exaggerating some things here. Like, for example, and some of y'all aren't going to believe me and my wife can testify My parents swear, now I was like four or five months old, so I can't vouch for this, but my parents swear I was like talking and singing at like four or five months old. And I told her in that, and she's like, that's bull. And then we talked to my parents, and they're like, we swear, okay? But but there's a lot of dumb stuff that I cannot share so that I don't incriminate myself that I I did in, in high school that my wife just didn't believe. And I would tell her these stories and I could just I would get so frustrated because I'm like, do you want me to call Timmy right now? Timmy's a real person. He's one of my friends. I know his name's Timmy, but that's just it is what it is. And I was like, do you want me to call Timmy right now? Because I'll call him. I haven't talked to him in three years, but I'll call him and he will validate everything that I'm saying. Well, one Christmas, we went back to Virginia to spend it with my family. And by the grace of God, all of my high school friends, a lot of my really close friends were all in town at the same time and wanted to get together. So we went to a restaurant. We went to hang out. And this was my moment. I I was like at the table. I was bringing up all the stories. They were co-signing me. They were like, oh, yeah, and you forgot this detail. And do you remember when we did this? And Finally, finally, my wife could believe what a hero slash dummy I was in high school and in college. My buddies were there to validate all of the stories that I had told my wife about my life growing up that she didn't necessarily not believe, just didn't like fully believe. You know what I'm saying? And and it can be so frustrating When you're telling somebody a story that you know is true, that actually happened, but they're not buying it. When you can tell by their body language or the look on their face that they think that you're exaggerating or embellishing or just flat out not telling the truth, right? And I feel like so often this is how it can feel when we try to begin a conversation of faith with one of our friends or family members or coworkers. Like we know what we've experienced. We know the radical change that has taken place in our lives. We know the addictions that we used to have that we no longer have. We know the habits that we used to have or the anxiety that we used to have or the depression that we used to have that we no longer have. And when we go and we try to share this with somebody so that they can also experience the freedom, they give us that look where it's like, I believe what you're saying, but I don't really believe what you're saying. And so tonight I want to talk about sharing our faith, especially in the context of when people have questions and people have doubts about what we believe, but also experience in the person of Jesus. I want to go back to our story that we just read. I'm going to reread the whole thing for you right now. I'm kidding. I'm not going to do that. Um, It was long. In John chapter 9, Jesus has an encounter with a man who is blind from birth. Now, it's interesting. Immediately, his disciples go into a conversation about why this man is blind. And this is a sermon for another day. But in that uh, in that uh, community at that time, a lot of people saw things like blindness or or uh, being a paralytic as either a sin you have personally committed or God cursing your family because of a sin that they had committed. And so Jesus encounters this man who is blind, and immediately his disciples go to talk about why he is blind. Now, interesting note: um, the man is blind; he's not deaf, and so he's standing there with Jesus listening to the disciples talk about his problem, 
right in front of his face. I don't know about you, but that'd be kind of frustrating to me. Um, but Jesus like answers their question and then he goes and engages with this man. In John chapter 9, it says this. Jesus went along. He saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, uh, that he was born blind? Nobody sinned, Jesus said. But it happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this... He spit on the ground, made some mud with his saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. I want to demonstrate that tonight to show you how it works. Stephen, can you please come up here? I want to... I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, He said, go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. I think that's an interesting name uh, just based on the series that we're, we're doing right now. It said, but so the man went and washed, and he came home seeing. Now, this might sound like a strange passage to sort of base a message on sharing your faith off of. But I actually think this first little chunk that we're going to talk about here of Scripture is pivotal to finding your passion to sharing your faith. I think it is foundational for any believer in Jesus to find that fire to go out and to share what they have experienced and encountered in the person of Jesus. Jesus is walking along and sees a blind man. Now, I could preach an entire message on that statement alone. Because in a lot of Jesus' healings, in a lot of them, someone approaches Jesus. Friends bring a sick person to Jesus. Uh, Somebody runs and grabs Jesus and lets them know, my friend is sick. Come, come find them. Can you come help them? Somebody in a crowd might crawl up and grab Jesus. But in this story, Jesus approaches this man, which tells me this man wasn't even necessarily looking for Jesus, but Jesus was looking for this person. And see, there are some of us in this room, we don't even know why we're here tonight. We wouldn't even say that we are specifically looking for a relationship with Jesus. We wouldn't say that we are looking for a religion. We're not looking for a faith. We're not looking for something to save us. But what I find so interesting is that even when you might not be looking for Jesus, Jesus is looking for you. Jesus is going out of his way to find somebody who is hurting and in need. And he finds this man, and chooses to engage with him. For the sake of time, I've got to move on, but, but, but I could preach that for 40 whole minutes, y'all, like 40 minutes. I could just sit on that, but we won't. Okay, here's what's interesting. I find this so fascinating. Not only is what like cool things that are like in the Bible, it's also interesting what people decide to omit from the Bible. Um, we're not given a lot of details about this guy. It just says, Jesus approached him, talked to his disciples, made some mud, and put it on his eyes and healed him. We're not given a lot of information about this man. All we know is this. He was blind from birth, meaning this was the only life he ever knew. He never experienced a time in his life where he knew what it was like to see something. He didn't know what the sky looked like. He didn't know what Jesus' face looked like. He never got to know the look of his mom or his dad when he did something and then made them proud. He only knew life in darkness. And I would imagine he did not even know that there was potential for him to experience life in any other way than had already existed. If that is not a picture of our culture, I don't know what is. We live in a world where people are spiritually blind where people are steeped in anxiety, steeped in depression. And I think we get to come into environments like this and think, oh, they should know that there's another option in life. But can I tell you, the Bible says, without a messenger, who will know? See, we think it's obvious, like there are options. To some people, it is not obvious. All this man ever knew was life in the darkness. And up to this point, he probably did not think that there was potential to experience life in any other way. All he knew was life this way. All he knew was sidebar conversations people would have about him and what he must have done to deserve this. 
All he would have known was the judgment that would have been placed on his family for what they assumed his family had done to make him this way. He didn't know life any other way, and he didn't know that anything else was possible until this day. See, until this day, he had no expectation of getting any better until he had an encounter with Jesus. Until this man had an encounter with Jesus. Now, this is only a guess. Don't get into heaven one day and say, Connor said this, because this is just my assumption reading and studying the Bible. I would guess that this man had heard about Jesus before this moment. See, at this point, Jesus had a reputation. He had a reputation as a healer, almost like in a mystic way, like back in that culture, like spiritual healings were a very prevalent thing. And so he had a reputation as a healer. Jesus also had a reputation as a rabbi. His disciples said rabbi, meaning teacher. People knew about Jesus. The Bible said that Jesus would draw crowds of hundreds and thousands. He would go to parties and hang out with people. Jesus wasn't some weird hippie recluse. Like Jesus was was going around doing things and people knew about him. And the reason I'm guessing this guy knows about Jesus is this. He allows Jesus to encounter him on Jesus's terms. Man, I think so many of us want to encounter Jesus as long as it's on our terms. I think so many of us want an encounter with God as long as it doesn't cost me anything. As long as God really doesn't expect me to invite my boss, not just my coworker, my boss, to young adults. As long as God really doesn't expect me to invite my, my sibling who I got in a fight with at Christmas and we haven't talked since. Like, as long as God doesn't expect me to like apologize to them and invite them to experience what I've experienced. See, I think a lot of us want to encounter God, but we want to encounter God. On our terms, the the reason I think this guy kind of knew about Jesus was because he was okay having Jesus encounter him on Jesus's terms. What do I mean? Who do you know that would let a complete stranger spit in dirt? (laughs) For real. Spittle it around a little bit. You know, Simba style, like, come here, Gotcha. You know what I mean? Like, who do you know that would trust a stranger to make mud with spit and put it on their eyes? Not me. Like, I I don't know how cool you think we are, but we're not that cool. You know what I mean? Like, I've got two children, uh, hopefully one day a third on the way with my wife. I'm still hesitant if uh, she spits on the ground, makes some mud and says, babe, come here. I want to wipe this on your eye. You know what I mean? Like, no, thank you. Love you, but we're not going to do that. Okay. This man is cool with it. He's cool with experiencing Jesus on Jesus' terms. He's cool with an encounter with Jesus the way that Jesus wants to encounter him. Now think about this. Jesus didn't just spit and make mud and put it on his eyes and he was healed. This man had to wear mud on the place of his biggest source of shame, his biggest source of insecurity, his biggest source of, of, of feeling excommunicated from society, and then walk to a place to get healed. See, to encounter Jesus on Jesus' terms for this man was to allow Jesus to expose the thing that caused him the most shame and then carry it around society until he got to a place where Jesus said to go and then he experienced the healing. See, I think so many of us want to encounter Jesus. But what if encountering Jesus was allowing Jesus to expose some things in our life that we don't want exposed? What if encountering Jesus was allowing Jesus to heal us in a way that we didn't know healing could take place, but it would cost us being vulnerable with the things that we hold most dear, the things that cause us the most guilt and the most shame, so that we can have a true encounter with God on God's terms. What I love about this man is this. He was willing to risk embarrassment to have an encounter with Jesus. See, you know, Jesus has a reputation, but what if Jesus was off today? 
And he just spit and made mud and put it on my face. And it didn't work. And I walked around town to this little pool or whatever to wipe it all off. And I'm still blind. All that happened was I looked like a total fool. You know what I mean? But what I love about this man who, who, I don't know, again, this is a guess, who I would assume knew about Jesus and then allowed Jesus to encounter him in this way. What I love about him is this. He was not satisfied by simply knowing, uh, knowing about Jesus. That wasn't enough for this man. He was willing to have an encounter with Jesus on Jesus' terms, and it changed his life. And please hear me when I say this. The reason that I believe some of us in this room don't have a passion for inviting people to experience what you've experienced, the reason I believe that the people in this room don't have a passion for inviting their friends and their family and their co-workers to church or are sharing what God has done in your life is because we are okay with a knowledge of Jesus over an encounter with Jesus. We're okay coming to church and getting filled up. Pastor, give me a word. I want to sing my favorite song. I don't want to do the minute mingle because it makes me feel uncomfortable. Like, I want to encounter Jesus on my terms. I'm cool with the knowledge. And And I feel filled up and I'll go out and live my life. The reason our room is not overflowing tenfold, the reason we're not having to rent out space downtown to to fit enough people in this building. And and listen, I fall in this category. Is because there are moments in my life where I settle for being okay with a knowledge of God over an encounter with God. And the only thing that can set your heart on fire and give you a reckless abandon and a reckless passion for sharing Jesus with people regardless of the consequence is when you have an encounter with Jesus on Jesus' terms. There has to come a day, there has to come a moment in your life and a moment in your faith where you draw a line in the sand and say, when I step over this line, it is Jesus on Jesus' terms. It is life Jesus' way. It is sexuality Jesus' way. It is finances Jesus' way. It is peace Jesus' way. And when I step over it, I'm not doing Jesus on my terms anymore. You will not have a fire to reach your city, your friends, your family if Jesus is just like your tag-along buddy. You have to allow Jesus to encounter you on his terms. And when you do, it will radically and recklessly change your life into a person who is dead but is now alive. It'll take you from a consumer Christian to an ambassador of heaven. Do you know that's what Adam and Eve were? The first humans, the humans created in God's image to be partners with God, they were not just there to enjoy God. God said, go have dominion. What was he saying? Be ambassadors of heaven, of life to this earth. And I think there are so many of us that live lives that are so short and under the bar of what God has for us because we are okay just being comfortable Christians, but we don't want to step into the mantle and the blessing and the anointing and the call of being ambassadors of the good news. Can I tell you what's going to change your city, what's going to change your family, what's going to change your friends is when you say, I'm done being comfortable, I'm going to be an ambassador. I'm going to go into foreign territory with my story and my encounter. And I'm I'm done with God on my terms. God, you can have all of me from, from the few hairs that are left on my head to my tiny little toe. Like, God, you can have every single part of me. I just want an encounter with you, Jesus, on your terms. Because if we're okay playing it safe, we'll trust him at a distance. We'll follow him as long as we're comfortable. We'll believe in him, but we'll never have an encounter with him that changes us forever. You'll never have a passion for reaching people until you have an encounter that changes you. As long as Jesus is a theory, you will find reason after reason to not be that weird Christian in your office. You'll find reason after reason to dismiss that tug on your heart where Jesus says, hey, you know that invite card that's on your, that's on your chair that you filled out for this person? Why don't you just give it to him? 
and invite them. Guys, I'm 30 minutes in, and I am on point one, okay? So we got we to gotta move forward. This is, but when you have an encounter with Jesus in his terms, it'll change you. And this was my prayer tonight. This isn't even really what the message is about. God just took it this direction. This was my prayer tonight, that we would be a room of people that would say, God, I'm willing to be encountered by you on your terms. I'm ready to be changed. I'm ready to be an agent of life, an ambassador of heaven for you. Here I am, Jesus. No restraints, no restrictions, no, I'll follow you as long as I get the girl, I'll follow you as long as I get the job, I'll follow you as long as I get the guy. Jesus, I will follow you no matter what. Man, that can't be stopped because that's the faith that conquered death coming alive inside of you. That is a person with nothing to lose because they've already gained everything. All right, I got to move on. The passion to reach others begins when you have an encounter that changes you. This man has an encounter with Jesus that actually like physically changes him. As in blind, now I see. And people begin to take notice. And notice what happens. Questions start rolling in. Don't be surprised when you open up your life to encounter Jesus on his terms and you start to get questioned right? This guy was literally blind, and he sees, and no parade, no congratulations, no high five. He is met with questions. Was this even real? Were you even blind in the first place? Like, how insulting. Like, yeah, bro, I was blind, like, my whole life. That was me. You know what I mean? Like, were you even blind? Is that even you? Were you the one begging? Yeah, that was me. Who is this Jesus person? I don't know. How can someone heal a blind person? Mud, apparently. Like, I don't know. Like, this has to be made up. This can't be real. And here here is where I feel like we can learn so much from this man who once was blind. Okay, we're about to read a big chunk of scripture again. Just hold on tight. Here we go. Okay. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging said, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, it only looks like him. But he himself insisted, No, I'm that guy, guys. Like, how were your eyes open then? They asked. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go and wash, and I did. And when I washed, I could see. Where is this guy? They asked him. I don't know. He said, they brought him to the Pharisees, the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened his eyes was the Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. Bro, I've told you, he put mud on my eyes. The man said, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man's not from God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. Others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? They were divided about Jesus. Interesting. Uh, Then they turned again to the blind man. Um, What do you have to say about him? It was your eyes that he opened. The man replied, "Uh, I guess he's a prophet. Uh, They still didn't believe that he had been blind, which is just wild to me, and uh, had received his sight until they sent for his mom and his dad. Is this your son? They asked. Uh, Is this the one you said that was born blind? How is it that he can now see? We know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know that he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He can speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid the Jewish leaders who had already decided uh, that anybody who acknowledged Jesus would be kicked out of the synagogue. That's why his parents said he's of age. Ask him. Okay, that's the last time we read that much scripture. Okay, but think about this. The man just got healed of blindness. And nobody believed him. I would be so frustrated. Yo, I'm just seeing my mom for the very first time and you're calling me a liar. Why would I lie about this? Why would I lie about having depression and now having joy? Why would I lie about being addicted to alcohol or drugs or pornography and now being free? Why would I lie about being riddled with anxiety and now having peace? 
Why would I lie about being blind, but now being able to see? This man spent his entire life blind, gets healed, and instead of a celebration, he gets hit with questions. His life is radically transformed, and they are doubting if it was him who was even blind in the first place. And I think this is where we as Christians get thrown off because we have an encounter. We are changed. We know who we once were and we know who we are now because of Jesus. And we go out and tell our friends and tell our family and tell our coworkers. And instead of getting celebrated or having people be like, no way, that's so awesome. I want what you have. Where did you find that hope? Where did you find that peace? Where did you find that salvation? Instead of being met with interest and intrigue, what are we often met with? Doubt and questions, just like this man who was born blind. And it is so frustrating. Listen, my life has been changed. Like, I'm trying to share this with you, and you don't believe me? And here's what often happens as Christians. We often respond in one of two ways. One, we either get defensive Or two, we tend to gain a savior complex. What do I mean Uh, when we get defensive? You have an encounter with God. You invite somebody to YA or you invite somebody to church in hopes that they have that same encounter and it just gets shut down. And sometimes our immediate response is to get defensive. It's to say, well, I guess you just don't get it then. Obviously, or they would be coming with you, right? Right? Or some of us, some of our response is to get self-righteous, to get a little Calvinistic. No hate to my Calvin, Calvin lovers out there. But, well, maybe this person just wasn't predestined then to, to know Jesus. Ignoring all the scriptures that says Jesus loves everybody and wants everybody to come to know salvation. But maybe you're just not one of the elect. Maybe you were just doomed at birth to be a subject of God's wrath. We, we, we get self-righteous, right? We get defensive, right? Or maybe they just don't have the faith enough to receive. Again, duh. Like, that's why they're not coming with you, right? But what can happen is when we get defensive, what happens is we tend to shut down because we start to think, well, if they're not going to respond, then what's the point, right? They just don't get it, so why even invite them in the first place? They're just going to think I'm weird. If I share what God's done in my life, well, they're just going to judge me you know, I might get canceled or on so is that is that even a thing like canceling anymore? Like, does it we've just proven that doesn't work like anymore? Like, might just cancel me, might not talk to me, might not get invited to her birthday party anymore, like whatever. Like, it doesn't work. So why even do it in the first place? Or what I see happen so often, and I think this happens with good intentions, is we tend to get a savior complex. We tend to think that if we have all the right answers to everybody's questions, we can then convince them to believe in Jesus. And I think we do this with the best intentions, right? If I just study enough, anything they throw at me, boy, bring it on. I got you. Leviticus 5, uh, Genesis 6, uh, Psalm 76. You're like, what? Uh, There's a 76 Psalm? Like, you know what I mean? Like, If I just study enough, or I remember as a young Christian, I I got saved on a college campus. That's why I'm so passionate about young adults, and it was not a Christian school. And I was going around talking to everybody, and everybody was asking me questions. I had no clue what the answer was to, and I heard about this thing called apologetics, which is like defending the Christian faith. And I was like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy some books on apologetics. So when they ask me a question, I'm going to ask them a bigger question, and they're going to get shut down, and they're going to be so confused they have no other option than to come to church with me and find Jesus, right? So we study or we like get a book on apologetics and we're like, mm, your question, take this bigger question. Hiya. You know, well, I, I don't know, like what? <laughs> well, we have the best intentions, right? If they have a question, if they have a doubt, I will know the answer. What about the big bang? God spoken, bang. You know what I mean? Like, The Bible says that God is three, but one, yeah, God's like an egg, you know, shell, white, yolk, like easy to explain. Move on to the next question, please. 
You're like, what? God's an egg? No, that's not what I said. (laughs) Man, you guys can make your way on up. We think if we can just have all the right answers, we can convince somebody to follow Jesus. And with the purest intentions and in the weirdest way, we get this like salvific complex that their salvation depends on our intelligence. That their salvation depends on our ability to read scripture, remember scripture, answer all of life's toughest questions. Can I just, good luck with that. Good luck. If you think that you can outwit and answer every question in the world to convince somebody to be a Christian, good luck to you. I have yet to see it work, but maybe you're the first. If a blind man who just received his sight could not convince people about Jesus, do you think that our feeble answers to some of life's toughest questions can convince somebody? Here's the truth. You can answer somebody's questions perfectly and completely accurate and faithful to Scripture, and it will never convince them to follow Jesus. Why? Because one, if I can talk you into it, somebody else can talk you out of it. And two, Jesus is not found with mental ascension. He's found with an encounter of the soul. Jesus doesn't want to be figured out. He wants to be experienced. He's a person. He's a living, breathing person. I don't study my wife to to, to know her. I don't don't try to figure out everything like mentally about her. I I never could, trust me. And and it goes both ways, okay. How do I get to know my wife? I talk to her. I hold her hand. I experience her as a person. You could answer every single one of your friends, families, co-workers, doubts and questions about God and never talk them in to following Jesus. So what do we do? What's our response when somebody has questions? How do we answer somebody who is doubting the encounters that we've had with Jesus and that we know he wants to have with them? What do we do? I feel like we take a page out of the the blind man's response. Listen to what he says. It says, A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. He replied, Listen, whether he is or not, I don't know. If you have your Bible, can you circle that phrase, I don't know? I feel like that's a phrase that we as Christians should get a lot more accustomed to saying. I don't know. What about Jesus? I don't know. What about the Big Bang? I don't know. What about evolution? I don't know. What about the Trinity? I don't know. Listen to his response. One thing I do know. I was blind, but now I see. I might not be able to answer every question you have, but here is what I do know. I was this person, and now I'm this person. I was, I was blind this morning, but this afternoon I can see everything. And there's only one thing that changed, and it was me having an encounter with Jesus on Jesus' terms. All these questions about Jesus, I don't know. Here's what I know. Once blind, now I see. There are some of you in this room tonight who are so afraid to have a conversation about faith or invite your friends or invite your family to church because you think you need to know everything, every answer to every question that they might throw at you to convince them about the faithfulness and the reality of God. Can I set you free tonight? Here is what you need to say. When your friends have questions or your coworkers have questions, here we go. Ready? I don't know. I don't know. And if I did know, it wouldn't convince you anyway. Now we can talk about faith. We can have hard conversations. We can try to figure it out together. But if you are looking to me to be the person to convince you to follow Jesus, bro, I don't know. Here is what I know. I was blind. 
Now I see. I was depressed. Now I have joy. I was anxious. And now I have peace. I was addicted. And now I'm free. I have had an encounter that has radically changed me from the inside out. I am not the same person. I don't even recognize myself. I might not have all the answers. I might not have all the knowledge. But what I do have is my story. What I do have is my encounter. What I do have is my testimony. I have been encountered by Jesus. And I have been forever changed. And what I know about my God is what he has done for me. He is willing and waiting to do for you. I might not know everything, but I do know this. I was blind on a road and Jesus chased after me. I didn't have to try to get my life together. He found me. Jesus found me on a basketball court at Virginia Commonwealth University because I recruited a six foot six XD1 player to play on my intramural team. And he said, You want to come to a Bible study with me? And I said, You're the best player we have, so I got to do whatever to make you happy. Like, you know what he didn't say? Let me tell you about the Trinity. You know what he didn't say? Let me talk to you about your eternal destination and whether you want, I don't want you to burn in fire for the rest of your life. You know what he said? I'm going to drop 30 in this league and you should come to this Bible study. And I just want to tell you how Jesus changed me. I am different because a guy had an encounter with Jesus and he was not afraid to talk about it. He didn't have all the answers. Over the next two years, me and him would become really good friends. And we, we would sit down and get coffee. And he would come to my dorm and we'd play Xbox. We'd play, what, Halo or whatever. And we would just talk about God. And I would grill him with questions. And you know what he would say a lot of the time? I don't know. We should pray about it together. I don't know. All I know is this. Jesus changed me. And you know what was crazy? I was like, that dude's changed. I grew up in church. I didn't believe any of it. But I could not deny what this guy said about the encounter he had in his life with Jesus. And I will never forget my freshman year of college bowing my head on a cold uh, plastic chair with Sam Paul Hamus sitting right to my side, a lot taller than me. But he was sitting right there. And I asked Jesus to have an encounter with me. And I swear it felt like I lost 50 pounds and I almost floated. And I don't know what, I, what to say, but the inside of my heart heart was transformed. God took a heart of stone and made it a heart of flesh, and I was forever changed. And it's not because I knew my Bible enough. It's not because Sam knew his Bible enough. It's just because he had an encounter that changed him, and he wouldn't keep it in. What if we were a room of people that said, Jesus, you can encounter me however you want to encounter me. You can change me however you want to change me. And here's what I promise you, Jesus, because you asked me to take your message into the world. When you change me, I will take what you have done in my life and I will multiply it over and over again. I will fight for the one. I will be the person that goes out and invites the one. I will pray for the one. I will encourage the one. I will continue to invite my friends. I will continue to share my story because I know what you have done for me you want to do for them will you stand to your feet I want to pray I've gone way too long but I'm fired up man because I remember what life without Jesus was like I remember how fake I used to be coming to church to please my parents and going out on the weekend and hooking up and partying and feeling so empty and hollow to the point where I wanted to take my own life. And all it took was a dude on a basketball court to say, you want to know what Jesus has done for me? He'll do it for you. Man, that can be us in somebody's life. God does not need us to reach the world, but he has chosen to use us to reach the world. And I believe, listen, there might be a thousand people on the other side of your story, 
but I do know this, there's at least one. And the reason we're doing this series and the reason we meet here every single Thursday night and the reason we come together on Sundays and worship Jesus as a church at Red Rocks Church and the reason those cards are on your chair is because I believe that God wants to use you to at least reach one person. So what about it? Will we be a community tonight that goes after the one, the way that Jesus came after us? With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to ask a simple question. I'm actually going to pray something real quick. God, I pray right now that you would put one person on our hearts. That right now, God, you would put one person on our hearts that needs to be here next week. That you would put one person on our heart that we need to text and say, hey, I love you. I'm praying for you. You want to get coffee? You want to come to church with me? That you would put one person on our hearts that we can call and encourage. Hey, I've got your back. I don't know what you're going through right now, but if you need anything, I got you. God, would you put one person on our hearts right now? And listen, if you came into this room and you don't know Jesus, oh man, he wants to know you so bad. He has been waiting. He is like planned in eternity this moment to encounter you. And listen, you want to know what's crazy? He doesn't want anything from you in this moment. If you don't know him, like, and, and you're just in this room and you're like, I don't know why my friend invited me to hear this dude scream on stage for 50 minutes. But I feel this longing in my heart that there's something more out there. And I don't know why, but I feel like it's in this room and it's calling to me. That's the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that Jesus stands at the door of your heart and knocks. And anybody who opens that door, he comes in. So tonight, if that's you, if you're like, listen, I, I want to encounter Jesus. Even if it's for the first time, would you raise your hand? I want to pray for you. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Hands going up all over the place. Would you pray this simple prayer with me? Jesus, right now encounter me on your terms your way I give you my life do with my life whatever you want thank you God in your name we pray Jesus amen hey can we worship Jesus like heaven is real, the enemy is defeated, and he wants to encounter you right here, right now. I believe right here, right now, in this moment, as we lift our voices to worship, depression will fall off of you. Anxiety will be loosed from your mind. Any fear, any doubt about what God has done in your heart will be solidified by the Holy Spirit. I believe you are becoming a new person. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are the head and not the tail. You are above and not belief or not beneath. There is nothing the enemy can do to thwart the plans of God on your life. There is no demon in hell nor angel in heaven that can stop the work that God wants to do in your life. So can we worship Jesus like we want an encounter with him? Can we worship Jesus like he is alive and moving? Can we worship Jesus like he's gonna go out and reach every single lost broken, hurting person in our world because he is good, he is kind, he is loving, and he has a fire in his soul to bring every lost person home. Why? Let's worship together. Come on. <laughs>